Hello, we are so excited that you chose to join us today online at the Jefferson Church. We believe that life is better connected and we wanted to thank you for choosing to connect with us. Isaiah 25 1 says, I will exalt you and praise your name for in perfect faithfulness you have done wonderful things, things planned long ago. Our God has done wonderful things in our lives. So let's get excited, prepare our hearts, and join the rest of our church family in worship. Show me a mountain he can move. He's a God of the breakthrough. Anything is possible. Would you show me? Show me one thing that's too hard. Show me what earth he can part. He's a God of the breakthrough. Anything is possible. speed of light and in his kingdom every dead thing is bound to rise our God our Redeemer he is faithful to revive oh, he will revive oh would you show me show me one thing he can do show me a mountain he can He's the God of the breakthrough. Anything is possible. Do you believe it? Show me one thing that's too hard. Show me what earth he can part. He's the God of the breakthrough. Anything is possible. It's possible. Oh, come on, keep those hands going. Oh, let's declare this next part out together. All of my feet. And all of my fear I will turn into praise And shake off despair as I sing out your name A victory dance, I will dance out in faith I will crush disappointment and break every chain All of my fear I will turn into praise 
shake off despair as I sing out your name. A victory dance, I will dance out in faith. I will crush disappointment and break every chain. All of my fear I will turn into pain. Shake off despair as I sing out your name. A victory dance, I will dance out in faith. I will crush disappointment. Show me one thing you can do. Show me a mountain he can move. He's a God of the breakthrough. Anything is possible. Show me one thing that's too hard. Show me waters he can't part. He's the God of the breakthrough. Anything is possible. It's possible. Oh, put those hands together today. Oh, as we celebrate that anything is possible with our God. Hey. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, come on, church, all over this room. Lift up a shout of praise if you believe anything is possible for us. No other hiding place. Our hope is safe within your name. This we know. This we know. You promise never to forsake. What you began, you will sustain. This we know, this we know. I will call upon the Lord, for He alone is strong enough to save. Rise, your shackles are no more, for Jesus Christ has broken every chain. Fullness of your word. This we know. This we know. And every enemy will flee. Oh, as we declare your victory. This we know. Yeah. 
Oh, come on, church. Do you believe that today? Oh, that the shackles have been broken. Oh, would you lift your voice as loud as you can? Hallelujah. Church, as you come to worship Jesus today. Hey, come on. Did you come to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords today? Hey, we're so glad that you're here, but we want to continue this moment of worship, continue this attitude of praise to our God today. And as our staff and our prayer team comes forward, I just want to leave you with this thought. If you came in with sadness, if you came in with a broken heart, if you came in with just discomfort in your life, or you came in with chains, I believe there's hope in the name of Jesus today. I believe if you call upon his name, things can happen. Things can change your life, no matter what it is. If you came in with something, you can leave different today. If you truly want to experience the power of Jesus, you can leave different today. So I encourage you to do something different, whether that's raising your hands or coming to get prayer or, or, or just finding yourself in a place of surrender today. So, God, we just surrender to your will and to your way. Because, God, we believe right now that you're our living hope, God, that you are our peace and that you are our strength. And just as we sing the last two songs, God, that you won the battle and that you break every chain in our life, God. So right now, God, we offer this moment of worship to you. God, we offer a heart of surrender, a heart of worship to you and you alone because we know we can leave different today, God. Or we know that we can leave changed because of you and your son, Jesus. And God, we thank you for the moments like this, like we can worship you and your son today. So God, would you move us? God, would we be led by the Holy Spirit right now in this moment of worship? We thank you for who you are and how good you are. And the church said together, Amen. You can come forward and we can continue to worship with us. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation I turned to heaven. And spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Oh, Jesus Christ. You're my living Lord. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to where my sin when bear my shame the cross has spoken oh i am forgiven the king of kings calls me his own beautiful savior but i'm yours forever oh jesus christ you're my the silence, the roar 
roaring lion declare the grave has no claim on me and then came the morning that sealed the promise and your very body began to breathe and out of the silence the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me yeah. oh Jesus yours is the victory Awesome time of worship. The Jefferson Church is able to bless our local community because of your generosity. At TJC, we love giving, and we have got multiple options to make it as easy as possible. You can mail a check to P.O. Box 674, Jefferson, Georgia 30549. You can give online by going to jefferson.church/give. You can text a gift amount to 706 686. 2199 or you can download the church center app search for the jefferson church and easily start giving online through the give tab again thank you for your generosity it truly does change lives now grab a pen and something to take notes on because we're in for an awesome message so today we're finishing july in jefferson and this series has a whole lot to do about nothing as far as the series title and name and all those things. July and Jefferson basically means Pastor Nick gets to talk about whatever he wants to talk about, which is really cool. You know, if you do a series on prayer, every Sunday I got to talk about prayer. But this Sunday, I, these Sundays, I just get to talk about what I feel like God is doing and moving and teaching and wanting us to see in our life. And so we talked about worship and the importance of worship in our life. We talked about prosperity and how people say, well, that he's a prosperity preacher. I'm a prosperity preacher as far as the Bible says I can preach prosperity. That he says, may your soul, so may you prosper as your soul prospers. God's not afraid of prosperity. We have tainted it. We've made it sound different than it should, but God is not scared of the word prosperity. He wants our lives to prosper. Can somebody say amen? He wants our lives to prosper. So we talked about that. Then last Sunday, we talked about the harvest and the importance of getting our lives, our church, ready for the harvest season that God is bringing. If you missed any of those, it's on YouTube. It's on Facebook. We'd love for you to go back and watch those throughout the week. Don't watch them throughout the week while you're driving. Listen to them while you're driving. But maybe watch them some other time. Today, the final part of July at Jefferson, I want to talk about um, next steps. I want to talk about the next step that each and every one of us have and that we have to choose the next steps in our life. It's not that God's going to push us or, or prod us or force us to do next steps. It's the choices that we have to make. And I'm looking at everybody in the room because this sermon touches everybody. It's not just for one person or one season or one whatever. Everybody in this room, whether you're old or young, male or female, whether you're a believer or a non-believer, everybody in this room has a next step. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So, Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you so much 
for all that you're going to do, all that you've already done. Five people have already given their life to you today, and I'm so thankful for that. Death to life, lame to walking, blind to seeing, lost to found. So thankful for that. That should never get old. I'm so thankful, God, for a church that sees the importance of allowing lost people to find Jesus. That church is not about us. It's about them. It's about the lost. It's about the one sheep, the one coin, the lost son. That's what church is about. So today I pray that you would help us to see that every single person in this room, under the sound of my voice, we all have next steps. And help us to make that choice to do that today. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen and amen. We all have a next step. And we have to make the choice to have these next steps. And hopefully over the next you know, 20 minutes or so, we're going to understand what a next step looks like in our life. But a next step is not something that God's going to force you to do. Wherever you are at, whatever journey you're leading in your life, everybody in the room has a next step. And we understand that physically, it's, a, it's obviously understandable in the physical world that we take next steps. I mean, when you get to elementary school, the next step is the academy. Then after that is middle school. Then after that is high school. After high school, you go to college. After college, you live in your parents' basement for 20 years. Come on, somebody. Like, like or what that's, there, there's always a logical next step, and it's very obvious that that's what it is in the physical world. You know, I get married, then maybe the next step for most of us is kids, and after kids, it's grandchildren. How many of you know, don't kill your kids now, better kids are coming? Come on, somebody. <laughs> grandchildren are coming. Um, <laughs> and then after that, you have empty nesters, and then you got retirement. Like, there, there's, there's obvious steps that we all have to make and take and prepare for, but for some reason, there's a disconnect in the spiritual world that, that most of us have have gotten saved and that's about it. Most of us have gotten saved and we took the first step, but then we haven't taken a step in a long time and that's what today is all about, to choose to take the next step. God's not going to force you. It's a choice that I hope you make today. And here's the phrase I want to give to you today, that choices, it's your choices that determine the distance between where you are and where God wants you to be. It's your choices. Listen, it is not up to God's determination where you go in your life. God has done so much. He gives you the free will and the choice to follow him, to go after him, or to stay where you are, or to go a different direction. It is your choice today. You, you cannot blame God. You cannot blame church. You cannot blame anybody else. If you want to blame somebody, blame you, because it's the choices that we make. And choices are pretty important. How many of you know it's not about your intentions, it's about your choices? Intentions are good. Intentions are great. But intentions do absolutely nothing. It's like spitting in the wind. I mean, it does absolutely, it's like pulling on Superman's cape. Come on, somebody. Y'all know that song? Maybe not. Different generation. Okay, so there's good intentions, but intentions are not good enough. I heard one preacher say it like this, hell is paved with good intentions. I don't want to go to your church, you know, <laughs> so I was thinking, but he said, hell is paid with good intentions. I, I had a, pre, uh, uh, a coach one time growing up, his name was Van Beecham, today's his birthday, and, uh, and he was one of, was just a father figure in my life, and, and he, his voice, he had this big, booming, sounding voice like this, it sounded like God would sound, like I think when I, when I hear God one day, I'm be like, you sound like Coach Beecham, oh my goodness. And, uh, and he would say this, I, I came in and I was late for practice one day and I was giving all these excuses. He said, well, I'm going to make you, but coach, but coach, he said, if, if and buts were candy and nuts, we'd all have a Merry Christmas. <laughs> I was like, is that in the Bible somewhere? Because that sounded like God's voice saying that. Like I thought, man, that's amazing. But it's not about your intentions. Your ifs, your ands, your buts, it's, it, it, it's about the choices that you make in your life. Listen to me, if you are wanting to go to the beach, you want to go to Florida, and you get all your bags packed, and you got your sunscreen, your bathing suits, you know, everything going, and, and you've got the cooler packed, and you're ready to make that eight, nine, you know, six-hour trip down to Florida, however way, whichever way you're going, and you get all the way down to 129, you pray, oh, God, bless us, give us traveling mercies in Jesus' name, you get all spiritual, and you get to 129, and you take a right and go 85 north, you will never get to Florida. You'll never get there. You can have all the intentions in the world, but it's your choices that determine where you go. It's your choices that, make, that, that lets you know the direction that you're headed in your life. Proverbs says like this, Proverbs chapter 2. The Bible's very, very wise. It says, wise choices will help you. Wise choices will watch over you. Wise choices will determine where you go. Not intentions. Intentions don't, don't amount up to a hill of beans. It's wise choices. Understanding will keep 
you safe. So today, I want to help us make the choice to take a next step with God. One more time, everybody under the sound of my voice, everybody breathing, living, blinking, and beating, everybody has a next step in your life. The question is, are you going to choose to move forward with that next step? So we start in Ephesians chapter 4. If you got your Bibles, we're in Ephesians 4. Last service, a guy walked in. He had three Bibles, everybody. He had three Bibles. I was like, man, you triple holy today. That's really awesome that you came in with three Bibles, but Ephesians 4 is where it is, chapter 1. It starts off and it says, therefore, everybody say therefore, everybody say therefore. Whenever you see the word therefore, you need to ask yourself, what's that therefore? There's a, what's well, supposed to be funny, it's just true. I had, who, who, the person who taught me to read the Bible said that. He said, whenever you see the word therefore, it's the culmination of something, and this is the peak. Like, this is the zenith. So everything he's done has built the case up to this moment, and then he says, therefore, and he's describing everything that's going to happen. So because we do this, this is what happens. Because we believe this, this is what happens. So he, Paul is saying to the church in Ephesus, he's saying, therefore. In, in Ephesians chapter 1, he talks about the love of God and how we don't deserve it. In Ephesians chapter 2, he talks about the grace of God and how we don't deserve it. In Ephesians 3, he talks about the riches of God and how we don't deserve it. So basically, God loves us, God gives us grace, and God takes care of us. In other words, God's got this thing, everybody. God understands the world. He understands where you're at in life. And with all that understanding, with all the understanding of God loves you, he gives you grace, and he's going to take care of you. Therefore culmination of everything, here's the zenith, here's the point I'm trying to make, therefore, I, a prisoner of serving Jesus, the Lord, beg you concerning all of his love, grace, and riches, he's done all that for you, now I'm begging you, live a life worthy of your calling, live a life worthy of your purpose, for you have been called, everybody say called, everybody say called, act like you had some coffee, come on left side of the room, everybody say called, Act like, he said, he said, you have been called by God. Live a life worthy of your calling, for you have been called. It's just as true for them as it is for us. So maybe what we could do, give me a little liberty here. Instead of saying this is the book of Ephesians, this is the fourth chapter of the book of Jeffersonians. He's talking to us, Jackson Countyans, right? Alabamians, I don't sound right, but, it, but like, it, this, is, this is for Jefferson and Jackson County people. This is the book he's writing to the church, to us. And he says, I want you to know something. In view of God's love, God's grace, and God's riches in your life, you have been called. I want you to do me a favor. Look at your most spiritual neighbor that you got right now and say, you're called. If you didn't get talked to, what's wrong? (laughs) You must not look very spiritual. (laughs) Maybe bring three Bibles next time and then somebody will talk to you. You're called. In other words, you have a purpose You have, I would say this, in view of God's love he's given you, grace he's given you, and riches he's given you, you have a responsibility to do what God's called you and asked you to do. In other words, God did not just save you so that you could sit in a pew and do nothing. God called you for something, a purpose, a time, and a responsibility. I know that there's a purpose for everybody's life in this room. You want to know why? How come, how come when we get saved and we lift up our hand and say, yes, I'm giving my life to Jesus, we pray the prayer, and our life is done, we've surrendered our life to God, why doesn't God beam us up Scotty to heaven right that very moment? If that would happen, do you think people would like raise their hand in church and they'd be like, I ain't raising my hand, I'll do something else, I ain't raising my hand, you know, because we'd be beamed up like heaven, to, with like beam up Scotty. But instead, God saves us, but I need you to know he saved you on purpose for a purpose. That's why you're still here. There is a purpose that you have yet to fulfill. The moment you fulfill that purpose, that's when you get to go to heaven. But we all have a purpose in our life, and that life needs to reflect the responsibility and the purpose that we have. Come on, say amen right there. Are you guys understanding what I'm saying? You're picking up what I'm throwing out. You have a purpose for your life. If you are breathing, beating, blinking, and moving, you have a purpose that has yet to be fulfilled. And you got to know when you gave your life to Jesus, that's the first step in the purpose of the rest of your life. You got to see that. So, so many of us go, okay, well, Pastor Nick, what is my purpose? Like, I don't know. And that's the question I get with a lot of believers, and that's the question I get with a lot of Christians and churchgoers. I don't know what my purpose is. And it's almost like we get to that place of, you know, when you're in high school, and or maybe even like when you're in elementary school and you're young, and you ask that child, hey, what do you want to be when you grow up? 
We all have a purpose or a search for a purpose. We all want our life to mean something and do something, and this is what I want to be. And God puts that in us at a very, very young age, but those questions don't stop just because you're young. You get older, and you're like, okay, I'm retired, and I'm an empty nester now. What's my purpose in this season? Okay, I've got kids now. What is my purpose in this season? Your purpose is to keep them babies alive. That's your purpose, okay? But, 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 but we all have a purpose and a design for our life, and we ask the question, what is our purpose? Because we all want to know what to do. Everybody hates it when, it's not, when the answer is not clear. Everybody hates it when there's ambiguity and we don't really know what's going on and we have to have actual faith to step forward and move on God. I, I'll never forget that when, when you walk into something and you don't understand, it's frustrating. I was 20 five, 26 years old, the first time I walked into a Starbucks. First time. And I'm not a coffee drinker. I, I just became a coffee drinker last year. As you can tell, I got a lot of coffee in my system right now. But I just became a coffee drinker last year. And I walked to a Starbucks for my wife for the very first time, you know, when I was 25 or 26. And I walked in and I said, I want a large, whatever the kind of coffee drink she wanted. And they said, I'm sorry, sir, you want a large? I said, yeah, large. They said, oh, you mean a venti? No, I mean large. And they said, oh, that's a venti. I said, no, venti means 20. That, that, doesn't mean, that doesn't mean, you know, venti means 20. And she said, well, if you want a large, sir, that's a grande. I looked at that little bitty cup. I said, that's not a large. That's a small. I want a large. They said, well, grande is large. I said, yes, it is, but that's not a large cup. This is a large cup. And you say it's venti. Venti does not mean large. It means 20. And I said, matter of fact, venti and grande are two different languages. So not only are you stupid, you're stupid in multiple languages. <laughs> I had a little altercation with the lady. And I was like, I, I don't understand this. And so I gave her my order, and, and we got all that figured out. So even to this day, I just roll my eyes when I'm saying, I want a large something. They go, oh, you want a venti? I'm like, oh, God. You know, like, don't even get me started there. But let me just go ahead and tell you, when, when I go and I give, like, coffee orders, like, we'll do a coffee order for the church or a coffee order for somebody, I'm speaking gibberish, and that person across the counter knows exactly what I'm saying. Let me give you Pastor Chanel's last coffee order. You guys ready for this? Watch this. Her last coffee order, because she frou-frou, come on, somebody. She, her last coffee order was this. I want a venti, decaf espresso, four shots of sugar-free vanilla, two shots of white chocolate mocha, a splash of heavy whipping cream, and two stevia. And I was like, did you get all that? She said, oh, yes, would you like that, like with a straw? And I was like, oh, my gosh, you understood that? I had no idea. It's, it's very frustrating when you don't know what to do and you're just sitting there literally reading a text and she knows everything. But when you don't know what to do, it's extremely frustrating. First time you walk into Starbucks and you're given orders that you don't understand because they sound like they're from another country, Right. Like, it's just, I don't even know what a stevia is. I have no idea. I'm talking about steaming something? I don't know. Like, I have no idea what stevia is, and it's just frustrating. I, I remember, um, so Brooklyn was our firstborn, and I was, I was pretty, like, you know, green, you know, whatever, whatever you want to call it. I was pretty young about having a child for the first time, and, and everything gets done. And when I, my first child, uh, Chanel, was um, giving birth. And I was real, like, standoffish. I, the doctor was like, you want to do this? I said, doc, you the doc. I'm the pastor. I'm going to stay back here on, over here, and I'm going to let all that stuff happen over there, and I'm just going to support from afar. Like, that's what I'm going to do. Because when she, was, when she was giving birth to Brooklyn, I came up real close to her, and, and, and she would push, and I'd be like, oh, Lord Jesus, thank you so much. You're protecting her. I was, like, right there in her ear, and she, I would support her. And I said, oh, Lord Jesus, you're doing such great. Oh, God, you're doing so great. She looked at me. She said, stop praying for me. You got it. I'm going to sit over there. You got it, girl. <laughs> you know. So I'm trying to learn. I'm trying to learn. And first child, you know, they do all the stuff. <laughs> they do all the stuff. And then they hand you this. And they're like, here you go, Dad. I'm like, now? Like right now? Yeah. Oh, yeah, now. And they don't, like, prepare you. or not, They don't give you classes. They don't give you a book. They basically say, hey, here's the baby. And they push you out the door. How many of you all know that's what happens at a hospital? They push you out the door. Well, number two comes. And I feel like I'm a little more prepared. But in the moment, Judah comes, and Judah is this big, fat ball of flesh. Just He's like fat and ears. That's all he is. He's just this big, just, whoa, just this child coming out. And he, I mean, he's just so beautiful and great. And the doctor, same doctor, looks at me. She says, Dad, do you want to cut the cord? And I don't want I mean, to be like graphic, but she was like, you want to cut the cord? And I was like, Doc, that's the boy. I don't want to cut the wrong thing. You just go ahead and like, <laughs> you're the doctor. I'm the pastor. When you don't know, like, you, don't, you just don't know, and it's scary, and you might mess some things up. You don't want to mess something up, right? And I'm just like, you know, you go, you got it. Go with God. <laughs> Clarity is key. If you don't know, a lot of times it keeps us from stepping forward. 
If you don't know what your next step is, if you don't know what your purpose is, a lot of times it keeps you from stepping forward. And because of that, I'm looking at a lot of people, including myself in my own life, if I look at the mirror, there have been times where I have stunted my development as a believer because I'm not taking my next step. Because it's not apparent, it's not obvious, and, and I need to know my purpose. So we're going to be, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, we're going to talk about taking our next steps, finding the purpose that God has for our life from the book of Ephesians chapter 4. Verse 11, now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers. To which you're like, Pastor Nick, that's you. Like, you're the pastor, the prophet, the apostle, the teacher, that's you. He's not telling, he's not saying I'm that. He's saying everybody in the body of Christ is that. Everybody plays a part. Everybody plays their role. You think I'm the only pastor in the room? I'm looking at about three to 400 pastors right now. Everybody in the room is a pastor. All a pastor is is a shepherd that leads sheep. It's a shepherd that leads people. It's a shepherd that uses the influence God's given them and points them to Jesus. Hey, listen to me. If you influence anybody, you're pastoring them. If you lead anybody, you're pastoring them. If you're a dad and you've got kids because you're a dad, you are leading them and you're pastoring them. Mom, same thing. Business owner, manager, whatever you are, you are leading the people that are following you and in that same light, listen to me, you are a minister of the gospel. You're an evangelist. You're a prophet, you're an apostle, and you have to start seeing yourself that, that way because if you don't, then you will possibly lead people, unbeknownst to you, you will lead people away from God. So we have to continue to lead people towards God. Come on, somebody say amen. He says that their responsibility is to equip God's people. That's our responsibility to do his work, build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith, knowledge of God's son, that we will be mature. Everybody say mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Another version says this, that we are moving forward in fullness. We're moving forward in completeness. In other words, we've got our gas tank filled up to the brim, and now we're ready to move forward because we have the faith and the purpose to take our next steps. You have to choose today. You have to choose now You've got to choose in your life to take a next step. And you say, well, I'm not going to make the choice now. You just made the choice. You just made the choice. Well, I'm too busy. Okay, you made your choice. Well, I'm not ready. Okay, you made your choice. Well, I, I'm not ready to worship God. I'm not asking you to go, you know, full like this in front of everybody for the first time. I'm just asking you to take a step. Everybody can choose to take one small step towards Jesus, and that's what I'm trying to get across to you today, that we all have a responsibility. We all have a purpose and a calling, and to find that purpose and to find that calling, we have to continually take next steps towards Jesus. The Bible says in the book of Jeremiah, if you come close to me, I'll come close to you. As you take a step towards me, I'll take a step towards you. So why do we need to take next steps? Why, what, why is this so important? And I'll give you three points and we'll be done. Ephesians chapter 4 says this, then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about like by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever that they sound like the truth. Why is it so important, Nick, that I take a, a step of faith? Why is it so important that I take a next step? Because taking your next step produces spiritual strength. And I would even say it produces spiritual maturity. Listen, just because you're old doesn't mean you're spiritually mature. It has nothing to do with what color your hair is, whether it's black or gray, or whether you don't got no hair at all. Like, it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The, the physical maturity of your life does not dictate the spiritual maturity of your life. I can tell you that right now. I know a lot of older people that are not spiritually mature. So, so it doesn't mean the age. I'm talking about are you consistently taking steps towards God because that faith will build spiritual maturity in your life. Listen to me. The book of James says that when you encounter issues and problems of every kind, that you will then grow in your character, grow in your morals, and grow in your faith because you are consistently taking steps towards God. Taking the next step, choosing to go towards God, towards your purpose, that will grow you spiritually and mature you spiritually. But too many times, people get saved and that's where they stop. And I believe the, the one thing that's the pandemic of the church today is not sin, it's immaturity. It's people not taking steps. 
It's people saying, well, I'm saved, and I've got my fire insurance, but I'm going to cuss like I always did. I'm going to drink like I always did. I'm going to cheat like I always did. I'm, I'm, I'm going I'm to do everything and I'm going I'm to do everything possible. I'm going to lie like I always did. I'm going to you know, cheat on my taxes. Like, like, like that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to keep going this route. When the Bible says that you are immature in your faith and you need to consistently take steps towards God. Can somebody say amen? Being a child has its good parts and its bad parts. I love childhood. I really loved it. You know what? I didn't have to cook when I was a kid. My mama cut my steak for me. You know, like Georgia Beth right now, she comes in the room and she like walk with her like bottle and everything. And she goes, she goes, uh, uh, I know what uh means. Uh means I want to eat. Guess what? She sits in her high chair and she doesn't like demand stuff or, or she just sits there. Come on. She knows food's about to get put on her plate. She gets little grapes and we cut them up like good moms and dads. We don't want her to choke, you know. And, uh, and we give her all these little things and Chanel's into this like, like organic kick and making sure our kids have, you know, fresh this and fresh that. I'm like, give the girl a lollipop. Come on, just, just give her something. And, and, and when you're a child, people bring you food. That's a good thing. I think it's great. When you're a child and you hurt, you get hurt, people hold you. Oh, baby, you're, not, oh, you're just so good. You, you, know, you, you pat them on the bottom and make sure they're okay and everything like that. They cry at night. You get up in the middle of the night. You make sure they're okay. Uh, how many of you know the, one of the best things about childhood is you don't have to drive? When you're 16, you want to drive. When you're 35, I'm tired of driving. I feel like I'm a car service for my children. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Like, like I, I don't want to do this anymore. I would rather be chauffeured and buckled in and everything. Like, I'd rather just have that done. Being a child is not all bad, but then there's a bad side to it where George Beth, last night before she went to bed, she, she pitched a tantrum. She had a big fit. I called it a Chanel fit. She didn't like that, but I, yeah, just, I joke. <laughs> it's really a Nick fit. But anyway, she said she, she pitched a fit. It's that immaturity that she has. She's helpless. She doesn't know what to do or where to go and all those things. I feel like in our churches today, I'm looking at a bunch of Christians that pitch tantrums when something doesn't go their way. I'm looking at a bunch of Christians that are helpless in their walk because they're immature in their faith and they're not taking the steps necessary to do that. Listen to me, as a church, we have got to grow up. I'm going to say it one more time. Aren't you glad you came to church today? <laughs> we got to grow up. You have to grow up. God did, not, God did not call you just to save you and that's it. But God saved you on purpose, for a purpose, that you move and take next steps with him. In the book of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews says that you are, you are on milk and you need to be on solid food. In other words, he's talking to Christians. He's talking to the church. Not talking to the world. He's talking to the church. And he says, hey, guys, you're still on milk. You're still a child in your faith. And you need to be moving towards solid food. How many of you know whole milk is great, but prime ribs better? Right? And, and, and he's saying, look, you need to be move on to prime rib at this point. But as, as Christians, as believers in our walk with God, we are, mo we are not moving in that direction. We're staying in the infantile state. Does anybody understand what I'm saying? Is anybody getting what I'm talking about today? And I'm going to tell you one more time. The issue in our churches is not sin. As a believer in Christ, God forgave you past, present, and future by the blood of Jesus Christ. Can somebody say amen? Your sins have been forgiven. The issue is immaturity. The issue is not moving forward in God, and I'm telling you that when you take your next steps, when you move in faith, move towards the purpose God's given you in your life, you mature, and I'm telling you, you build strength in your life. Number two, from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15, he says, instead, we will speak the truth in love. I can do a whole sermon on just that phrase right there, that in our world today, we are great at speaking truth, but we are terrible at doing it in love. And because of that, we cause arguments and fights and issues. And can I tell you something? I've never met one person that got saved because they lost an argument. But if you speak the truth in love, like the Holy Spirit does, and show them a better way, I promise you life will go better. Another sermon, another day. Speak the truth in love, growing in every way, more and more like Christ. Every single day, growing more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. The second thing that I want to say about steps is when you take your next steps, you become more like Christ. When you take your next steps, you become more like Christ. Do you want to know the purpose of your life? To be like Jesus. That, that's your next steps. Your next steps are supposed to be pointing you and taking you and making you more like Jesus. Can somebody say amen? Y'all real quiet out there, okay? Just, hopefully it's because you're being convicted. That's what I'm hoping. But taking your next steps, it develops you and makes you more like Jesus. Nobody in this room is perfect. Nobody in this room has no more steps to take. We all have another step. If you are perfect, Jesus, raise your hand. We're glad you're here. 
But otherwise, we all have a next step of maturity and a next step to be like Jesus that we have to take. That when you get saved, listen to me, the Bible says when you give your life to Jesus, you are no longer you, you become you through Jesus Christ. In other words, the old you is done and the new you has come. The Bible says that if you're in Christ, he makes you a brand new creation, not a remake, not a remodel, not take the broken pieces and make a masterpiece, nothing like that. No, you are brand new in Christ. The old is gone, the new has come. That's what signifies, we signify in baptism, you are buried in Jesus Christ and you raise from the dead, alive in Christ, when you give your life to Jesus, you are over. You're done. Your, your life's done. A lot of people say, well, I have anger issues. Dead people don't get angry. Hey, I have a problem with this. Dead people don't have problems. Hey, I have an issue with this. Dead people don't have issues. Why? They did. He says in Galatians 2, and we'll get to it in a second, he says in Galatians 2, I have been crucified. Go ahead and give it to me. I'm sorry. I've been crucified with Christ. I'm dead. I have been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I that lives, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith, taking steps towards the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Can I tell you something? I don't need to survive. I don't need to exist. I don't need to go on. I don't have to be scared of death. You want to know why? I already died. When I was seven years old, I died. Nick Dalton's done, and Jesus, through Nick Dalton, came to life. And that's the steps you have to take. That maybe the reason we haven't found our purpose, and maybe the reason why we feel so hopeless, and maybe the reason why we feel so burdened in our life is because there's too much of you in your life. There's too much of what you want, too much of what you think is right. And to be quite honest with you, the Bible says that when we gave our life to Christ, we are dead in Christ and alive in Christ in the very next moment. So what does a life like Christ look like, Pastor Nick? What's my purpose? If I'm supposed to be like Jesus, if that's my purpose, what's that supposed to look like? I'm so glad you guys asked. You're so inquisitive this morning. I'm very thankful for that. It gives us the answer in Galatians 5, that the fruit of the Spirit. The way you look like Jesus, when you are like Jesus, this is what happens in your life. You're full of love, full of joy, full of peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. You're full of these things. That's how you know. If you are short, if you are short in one of these areas, you don't got a lot of love for people, don't have a lot of peace, you don't have a lot of gentleness, you don't have a lot of kindness, you don't have a lot of self-control. If you are short in these areas, it's because there's too much of you in those areas and there needs to be more of Jesus. Can somebody say amen? So that's the purpose of our life. And we have to continue to take next steps to get to be more like Jesus. But more than anything, these are fruits of the Spirit. Fruits are something you can see. It's obvious. That's an apple tree. That's an orange tree. This is a banana tree. This is a peach, pear tree. Well, like, like fruits you can see. When you become more like Jesus, listen to me, people notice on the outside. It's not just an inner thing. It's the outside thing. So let me tell you to you like this. Everybody, Jefferson is watching you. Jackson County is watching you. People will or will not accept Jesus. People will or will not go to church based on the way you live your life. You're a pastor. You have a purpose and a calling, but there's a responsibility that comes with that. In other words, if you're leading people and you're not leading them to Jesus on purpose with next steps, then guess what? You're leading them down the wrong path. And they look at your life. They watch your life. There is a responsibility when you get saved to take next steps to be like Jesus and that people see Jesus through you. That people see Jesus through you. People are watching. I struggled when we first came here six and a half years ago. I really struggled. I said, let's not do window stickers. I go to this church and here's on my window. Let's not do bumper stickers. Let's not do car plates or nothing like that. I really struggle with that. You want to know why? Because when we drive, people see Jesus through us or not. Matter of fact, I'll be the first one to tell you. When I'm drive, when I drive, I'm about that much saved. About that much. But every now and then I have to remember, man, I got Jefferson Church on my windshield. I've got Jefferson Church on my back plates back here. And in the manner that I live my life, in the manner I drive, in the manner of my kindness, in the manner of my long suffering, if you're on 85, come on, somebody. In the manner of my gentleness, in the manner of cutting people, like People see me, they need to see Jesus. And if not, I need to take a step of maturity forward. 
Last and final thing. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. In other words, when you take your next steps and you move towards your purpose, when you take your next steps, it leads you to the purpose-filled life that God has for you. When you take your next steps and try to be more like Jesus, it takes you closer to the finish line. Now, I know I'm not where I should be, but I'm a long way from where I started. I know that I'm not at Z yet, but I'm a long way from A, and I'm telling you, those next steps, those steps I've taken in faith, chose to take towards Jesus Christ, they lead me to my purpose in life. If you don't know what your purpose is yet, take a step towards God today. If you don't know why you're here, if there's some emptiness, some blandness, I can't believe I got to come to church, I can't believe I'm, I, that, that my wife dragged me here, my parents dragged me here, whatever it is, if you, don't, if you don't enjoy the Christian life yet, you need to take a next step towards God and discover your purpose in life. And I promise you, you'll wake up with a passion and a purpose for life like you never knew before. You've got to do that. that. The life he has for us is full of life and hope and destiny and purpose. When I, was a, when I was a kid, I never got, I, I say it like this, I'm, I don't mean to sound bad or to make somebody upset. I never got diagnosed with ADD, but I do have like some cognitive issues. I, I, I think I'm pretty smart. I'm like, I'm not like a dummy. Like, you know, I could, like my SAT score was, was pretty good and um, my major in college, you know, all the supply. I'm not a dumb person, but there are just moments I'm like, squirrel, and like I can't focus on, matter of fact, this message, what I'm doing right now is an absolute miracle. Y'all, I almost failed my speech class at Georgia, not Harvard, not Yale, Georgia, where we barely speak English. Come on, somebody. I, I almost, so like, what I'm doing right now is an absolute miracle. It's that I can even just put thoughts together that, that make sense. But my mom, growing up, she used to make me put puzzles together because puzzles would help me focus and, like, give me something to do in, in the summertime or whatever. She'd give me puzzles. Now, I love 100-piece puzzles, thousand piece puzzles are straight from Hades I don't do those but hundred piece puzzles I'll do those in, in a minute and here's the thing about puzzles you look at the box on the outside and it gives you a picture of what the end result of the puzzle is supposed to look like hey guys there's a picture on the box that tells us what our life is supposed to look like there's, there's a description. There's supposed to be a tree here and a lake here and a cloud there and a horse and buggy there. Like it gives us a description. That's what God's word does. It gives us a picture of what our life is supposed to look like, full of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. It's the picture on the front of the box. But how many of you know when you open up the box, just like you open up your life, a, a perfect put-together puzzle doesn't fall out. It's little pieces that go everywhere. And then you got to start piecing things together and go, okay, well, i got to put this here and put this there. And, okay, that doesn't fit. fits now, you know, that kind of thing. And I mean, we, we, all, we all have our a journey of putting that thing together, and that's like our life. That, oh, i got this tree ready, but, man, i got to get the lake ready. Oh, i got the lake ready, but again, i got to. And eventually, as you have taken steps to put that piece of puzzle together, all of a sudden it becomes a picture. And you snap it together. It's like, oh, that's what it's supposed to look like. In the same way, I'm praying that the Holy Spirit gives you that, oh, that's what it's supposed to look like. Oh, this is what I'm supposed to be. Oh, this is obviously what I'm supposed to be doing. Last scripture, Ephesians 4. This will continue. In other words, this process is a journey until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ and the life that God has for us. Hey, can I tell you something that... God's heart, his purpose for your life, the dream of our church is to help you take your next step. Everybody's got one. Everybody under the sound of my voice, here again, blinking, moving, beating, breathing, thinking, we have a next step. You're on a different level than some other people, but we all have a next step in the journey. The dream, the heart of God and the dream of, the, of this church, the purpose of this church is to help you take your next step so that you can be more like Jesus and lead others to the throne of Jesus. That's the purpose of your life, with everything you do. So the church lays it out in three ways, and I'll give it to you real quick. The first thing we say is, well, first of all, we say that life's better connected. So as a church, we believe life is better. Life is better. Come on, one more time, like you Pentecostal. Life is better. Connected. 
that God's called us as a church to connect you to three things. Every time you walk in the door, every time we see somebody, I'm trying to connect people to three things. I'm trying to connect them to Christ. That's first and foremost. And you got to take that first step. There are people in this room, that's your first step today. Five people last service, that was their first step today. That I'm going to be connected to Christ. Being connected to Christ is salvation. It's giving your life to him. It's you dying and God living through you. Connected to Christ is baptism. It's praying every day. It's reading the word of God. And some of you are like, well, I can't do it early in the morning. Okay, pray and read the Bible late at night. I cannot think of a better way to fall asleep than to have the words of God on your lips. I can't think of a better way to to fall asleep than to be praying to the Father who watches you while you sleep and guides you and protects you. I can't think of a better way. That is part of being connected to Christ, that relationship with Jesus. That has to be the first step. But then our heart and our dream is that we connect you to your community. We connect you and let you see we have to be an outward-focused church. We cannot focus on the inside. We have to focus on the harvest that's on the outside because the harvest is plentiful. God said the harvest is there. God said the harvest is ripe, meaning it won't always be ripe. There's an urgency that we have to take to move forward and to get it and to bring them in before it's too late for them that we have to see that God wants us committed and connected to our community. Can somebody say amen? Mark 10, 45, Jesus did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. That's serve days, that's door holders. I'm telling you, there have been more people standing at those doors with name tags. I don't even know who they are, but guess what? They're serving. They're, they're believing that they're making a difference. When they're out in that parking lot and they're sweating bullets with those, with those orange vests on, guess what they're doing? They're serving you. They're connected to their community. When they go to serve days and we do serve day projects all around the city and all around the county, when we give cars away and we do all those things, listen to me, you are being connected to your community and I believe that's the next step that we should have. Last thing, he wants you connected to your church family. That's what groups are. Today we start connect groups. Today we start, the, I would say, the online launch of our connect groups. And I want to encourage you, go to Growth Track. That's serving. If you want to serve and you want to be connected to your community, go to Growth Track. That's the first and second Sunday of every month at the 11 o'clock service. You can go online to sign up on our website and show up at the basement of the, uh, at the top of the hill, the basement top of the hill, and be a part of Growth Track. That helps you get connected to community. But if you want to get connected to a church family and get in a group and have people help you in your life and help you when you're struggling, and help you when nobody else sees you and really lift you up and encourage you, you need to get online and you need to join a group. Or maybe you need to lead a group. Listen to me. We are not a church that has groups. We're a groups that come to church on Sunday. You don't learn as much this way. As much as I wish you did, I wish a, a, a monologue would do you good. And sometimes it does. You know what's better? The Bible says it's better. It's better from it don't, not learning in rows. It's better to learn in circles. It's better to talk in circles. Why? James chapter 5, confess your sins one to another, and you'll receive healing. You'll receive revelation. It'll help you take your next step. When you get around people that love you and care about you and want to see what's best for your life, it makes a difference. Can somebody say amen? What's your next step? What's your next step? What's God telling you? Hey, God's talking. The question is, are you listening? question is, can you turn down everything else in the world, everything else in your mind, everything else in your journey, and know that God's talking to you? Will you listen? Bow your heads and close your eyes with me just for a moment. Just for a moment. I want to give you the opportunity today, maybe you haven't done it ever, hadn't done it in a long time. I want to give you the chance to ask God a question and then listen. Ask God a question and listen, wait for a response. Here's the question. I want you to ask the Father this question. What's my next step? What's my next step? Not as a father, not as a mother, not as a worker, As a believer in Jesus Christ, what is my next step? 20 seconds, silence, with the keys playing. I just, I want you to ask God that question and see what he says.
Maybe some of you, your next step is to give your life to Jesus. It has to start there. You can be a good Samaritan all you want. You can serve. You can be connected to people all you want. But if you're not connected to Christ, it doesn't add up to anything. I want to ask you right now, do you need to give your life to Jesus? Is that your next step? Do you need a fresh start, a fresh commitment, a, 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 a new new journey, re, redo, whatever you want to call it, first time, it's salvation nonetheless. You say, but today I need to surrender my life to Jesus. It's that simple. I believe you're in this room, and I believe that's your next step for some of us here today. You say, Pastor Nick, I want to give my life to Jesus. Heads bowed, eyes closed. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not going to pull you down in the front. It's between you and God, but I just want to pray with you right where you are. You say, Pastor Nick, I want to give my life to Jesus. If that's you, would you just lift up your hand right now? Courageously and boldly say, today's the day I want to surrender. Today's the day I want to surrender. Come on, lift it up high. I saw some hands moving. I just want to make sure. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I thank you for the people in this room. I thank you so much for who you are. God, that we would take our next step. It's a choice that we have to make. God, I'm asking that you would do a mighty work in this church. We would be outward focused to the community. We would be inward focused to each other and connect with each other. But ultimately, God, we would take a next step towards you today. You would change the way we talk because of those next steps. You change the way we act because of those next steps. You change the way we think because of those next steps. Everything we do moves towards you today. And I just pray that today we make the choice to make a step forward. Maybe that step forward is coming to 21 days of prayer. Maybe it's getting a growth track. Maybe it's joining a connect group. Whatever it is, I pray those next steps would be taken in the name of Jesus. We thank you for all that you've done. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said, hey, can we give God praise for his word today? Come on, let's give God praise. Thank you, Jesus. Did you make a decision for Christ today? We would love to provide your next steps in your newfound relationship with Jesus. Just let us know by commenting in the chat and saying, that's me, or you can email our staff at office at jefferson.church. Thank you for joining us online today at TJC. We can't wait to see you next Sunday.